are part of a profession, a medium that is very gendered. And masculinity, per se, is an issue, but I think generally gender itself needs to be unpacked in terms of the roles that people have within it and how things have been positioned, the type of imagery that is produced, who produces them, who uses them. Those are all issues that we have very three, three very interesting people to unpack for us. Uh, Anush, I'm not sure how I pronounce your surname. Baba Janyan? I, I passed. Okay. <laughs> so, um, where were we last? Was it Diyarbakir where we last met? Yes, okay. So, Diyarbakir in Turkey, we, we, when we first got together, we started chatting away, we thought of all these things. And then she's here now, so it's wonderful to see you here, but more significantly she's part of a very well-known agency called Seven. Uh, sadly, some of the Seven members have just left early this morning, but they were here, they're a very important part of Chobimala, they've been involved in many ways, and the Seven agency has played an important role, particularly Gary himself, he's brought his students across to Bakshala on many occasions, and was the person who initially supported some Pachala students going to the Angkor Wat Festival where they also met many other young people and they began a network which was quite interesting. So Anushi will talk presumably about her agency and around the agency but on the main issue we're talking about. World Press Photo is of course a very credible <coughs> organization known the world over though when I started talking to World Press I did question whether they should be called World Press or European Press. Uh, happy to say they have moved on since then. And they've also played a very important role, not only in terms of the contest, which they're known for, but in terms of education, training generally, and supporting organizations. World Press did also provide a small grant to Kachala right at the beginning. And it was World Press's series of seminar programs that allowed us to begin um, Kachala. More significantly, earlier on, it was in, I think, the 2nd of August, 1994, that we first had the World Press Photo Exhibition in Bangladesh. And I'm not going to go into the history of that, but one thing we did do at that time, which is quite interesting, is we wanted our politicians to work together, the political group to work together. We knew there was no chance of getting Hasina and Khalida together, but we thought maybe we could get the two deputies. And the first opening of World Press Photo in Bangladesh, we had Abdul Samad Azad and Buddhid Azad Chaudhary cutting the ribbon together. Abdul Samad Azad went on to become foreign minister, Buddhid Azad Chaudhary went on to become president, but they've never gotten together again. <laughs> so that was one point. Um, easily the most important name in the world of photography is the word Magnum. The name Magnum, the word Magnum, the people who uh, set it up, a legendary Bressor, Chin, David Seymour, all, all those people, and Kappa, of course. Um, we've worked with Magnum over many years, and again, um, when we started Bakshala, it was Chris Boot. He was just then, in fact, leaving Magnum to join Faden. But he was very much a Magnum person up at that point. And we've had a large number of Magnum photographers. Some of them, even before Pachala started, Martin Barr um, was one of the early trainers, and we had Ian Berry, Martin Barr, and many, many other people over the years. Uh, it's certainly a delight to have them. Another important part of Chobimala is the fact that, I, I might mention briefly, the first time I took two young photographers, Chesat Nurani and Mahmoud Math, to Paris, um, because they were going to join me in the show I was having in Al. I asked my friend Abbas, who was then the president of Magnum, to take them around Magnum. They would walk the corridors. The idea that they would walk through the corridors that Kante Bresso and Fidelka had walked through meant they hardly slept that night. And the following day, they were on cloud nine. And it was really the response they had to that event that made me realize I need to make this available to many more people and led to the idea of what eventually became Chobimala. So 
that's a long background to two very interesting, uh, three very interesting people from very important organizations. I'll leave it to them to talk about Ishu, Anusha, uh, Noel, and where is ah, David? All yours. And David and I are fellow professors at Sunderland University, so there's another link. We live a few minutes from an area that um, Armenians unofficially call Bangladesh uh, in uh, my city, Yerevan. And uh, so I've pronounced the name Bangladesh for many years, all my life, but I've never been here. So I'm very happy and honored. And now I can tell all my friends about it. And um, it's been very kind here. So I am not only going to present my work here, but also the work of um, all, all seven um, women photographers of Seven Photo Agency. I'm very honored to do that because um, this project called Her Take, Rethinking Masculinity, um, has uh, only been exhibited to once um, before in uh, Photoville, uh, at Photoville Festival in New York. And um, uh, we were very much looking forward to showing this work um, as um, often as possible. So, Seven Photo Agency announced a new call for membership in uh, November 2017, uh, I mean fall 2017, and then in November uh, 2017, six uh, um, more women photographers joined the agency, uh, and there was uh, already Jessica Demek, uh, who was uh, who had been um, uh, with the agency for probably a decade or so, and. Um, and so we were all very happy to join. And uh, someone coined the name Seven of Seven. Um, and at some point, um, I had this um, I had this thought that, oh, OK, there's the Seven of Seven. We should do something together. And so I got myself together and wrote to everyone at the agency and wrote to the women and said, OK, let's do something together. Let's maybe. Um, do a project, do an exhibition. And um, so we met for the first time in Barcelona in uh, March uh, in 2018 and um, thought about the general idea. Uh, and this was a time when the <coughs> Me Too movement was prevalent. It still is, it um, always is. Um, and um, there was a lot of conversation about uh, femininity and masculinity and uh, uh, considerations and reconsiderations of what it meant for everyone in, in personal lives, in careers, in workspace. So uh, we decided to each um, present our take um, on masculinity, and so we called this uh, project Re Her Take Rethinking Masculinity. And I'll uh, read uh, a little bit about it. So Her Take Rethinking Masculinity is an exhibition in seven parts by the seven women of Seven Photo Agency. Each photographer undertakes a visual reflection on masculinity, reframing it, challenging it, referencing it historically, exploring it, considering in specific cultural context and changing social conventions or coming out from the shadow of it. Um, and so I will go one by one to uh, show you the project of each one of us. So the first one that I will talk about is um, um, the portrait series of uh, uh, photographed by Linda Bonana Engelberth, who is um, um, amazingly soulful photographer who is based in Oslo. Uh, she uh, photographed uh, non-binary people um, in Norway, in Britain, in Indonesia, among other countries. And uh, so she, since she's an amazing portrait photographer, this is how she decided to present a series uh, through portraits. Uh, so the project is called Outside the Binary, and 
this is how she presents it. The um, portrait project outside the binary explores the world of people that identify as non-binary. Genderqueer people see gender not as binary with men or women, but as a spectrum that ranges from masculinity to femininity. Most genderqueer people identify somewhere between or outside of conventional masculinity or femininity. So the person on this photograph is named Adea, and um, they say, at this time I can't see us all agreeing on what gender actually is. As such, I can't define myself in terms of gender either, and I don't feel the need to. There is so much more exciting and interesting to a person than their gender or sexual orientation. I rather use gender queer than non-binary. It's a political term not only describing my individual positioning, but my rejection of binaries as a whole. I think gender is something fluid, and the world is non-binary in itself. And this person named Folk, uh, 21 years old. So Folk identifies as agender, often described as someone who identifies and expresses their gender completely outside of the gender binary, also identifies as a non-binary trans person. Folk uses the pronoun they, them. Faye, Faye is in, in the front. Um, Faye identifies as a non-binary person. Faye uses the pronoun they, them. For me, being non-binary is more of an internal thing. The way I dress, the way I present myself to others has always been quite back and forth. One day I look more stereotypically masculine, the next day more female, one day androgynous, uh, but internally I consistently feel like I'm neither. Um, Ozzy in uh, from Jakarta, Indonesia. Living in um, Jakarta, Ozzy identifies as non-binary, uses the pronoun, pronoun she, her. I lean more towards being non-binary because I love my feminine side. I explore myself through art, fashion, I wear women's clothing, heels, and so on. It's been a long journey for me. <clears throat> and so that was Linda's, that was Linda's project. Um, and now I will go on to tell you a little bit about Maggie's um, portrait series, Men Born from Blossoms. Now this is a uh, small part of uh, Maggie's larger uh, project called The Secret Garden of Lily La Palma, which is, uh, I sometimes call it Maggie Inside Out, because it's uh, everything, it's, uh, it's all um, of the magic that uh, Maggie uh, represents everything sort of out, out in the open. And I guess it um, kind of takes time and uh, experience and the spiritual depth that Maggie has to be able to present that to others and be ready, ready to do that. So Maggie says, um, I grew up without a father or any male influence, and so men have been a mystery to me in some ways. I've had plenty of boyfriends in one 30-year relationship and lots of male friends, but I still find them mysterious in ways that I hope they find women mysterious. I want to present men in ways that are unexpected and something they themselves do not expect or think about, so I began photographing men with flowers. The flowers do not speak to or about any gender issues or designations or choices. The men I photograph are straight or gay or older or younger. I just choose the men according to how they move me or because I think there is something special about them and because I think they are beautiful people. I try to select the type of flower that seems to be like them or remind me about some quality they have. So the captions are 
pretty short, and that was an in presentation of um, the other idea of this project. This picture is called Man Born from Blossoms, photographed in uh, Penang, Malaysia. Marino in the Middle in Mexico. Michael with color lilies in uh, Miami, Florida. The Saint in Blossom in Haiti. And uh, Geo with purple roses in uh, Miami, Florida. So I really encourage you to uh, take a look at what Maggie does with this uh, larger project, the City Garden of Lady La Palma. She um, posts a lot of the, the, these photos on her Instagram account. and I think she's currently working on another part of this project called uh, uh, the Army of Lizards. So that's another interesting one. OK, now, now Sarah Terry. So Maggie Steber and Sarah Terry are um, two emeritus members of a uh, certain photo agency. And so um, we really love them. We would have loved them no matter what. And um, Sarah's project called uh, Rethinking the Male Gaze is a very peculiar one. It is different from uh, the work that uh, she usually does. She said, um, documentary photographer, she's a photojournalist, but here this work is much more conceptual and uh, mm, extremely deeply and well thought of because um, that's just how Sarah is and uh, this, uh, in, in this project she went very far in her, <coughs> in her study and research of what she thought was um, masculinity, what she thought masculinity was about. So rethinking the male gaze <clears throat> is my response to the contemporary conversation about gender, power, and representation. I'm engaging as a photographer with some of the most famous paintings and art history made by men of nude women, recreating the paintings as gender flipped photos. With that as my starting point, <clears throat> I carefully research each painting, learning about its cultural context, reading feminist critiques, understanding each work's place and art history. And then I restage the painting, taking on the creator's role as a woman, choosing backgrounds, time, <clears throat> place, objects, message, grounding the work in my own female gaze, putting together my own narrative and critique of gender, power, and representation. So the first word that um, Sarah presents um, <clears throat> is uh, the following, I'll read her words. So I created Rethinking Manet's De Jeunesse sur l'herbe as the first photo in Rethinking the Male Gaze, a series of photographs of famous paintings um, of nude women um, made by men. And I chose it for many reasons. In particular, the fact that the three main figures in the painting are each engaging in some act of uh, communication, gesture, glance, but none of them is acknowledging the other. And this is what Sarah recreated. That's what I feel has happened in the first stages of the Me Too debate. We aren't hearing each other yet, aren't engaging in dialogue across gender, generation, and color, but we will. And in the third image, she um, adds annotations um, to explain why she uh, did what she did. So this didn't used to um, exist, uh, and we didn't have this in the photo exhibition, but um, for now, that is how she uh, uh, decides, uh, mm, how she uh, is going to present them in, uh, um, in these triptychs. So <clears throat> the next one is the birth of Venus. The Roman goddess of love is a creation story that begins with a most brutal act of violence. According to mythology, Cronus, the son of Uranus, cut off his father's testicles with a stone cycle and threw his genitals into the sea. They caused the sea to foam, and out of that foam, Venus was born. 
<clears throat> a man's creation story of woman, the goddess of beauty, and love born from sexual violence. I respond the only way I know how, and this is Sarah on the left and right side. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I respond the only way I know how, by telling a story of my own. With rethinking the birth of Venus, I have appropriated this creation story on every level as a woman, including placing myself in the photo as the god, goddess, goddesses in the painting, in an era of angry man, I choose to create man from love, and rather than hold a cloak to hide his nakedness, as in Botticelli's painting, I hold a mirror, inviting him to see himself without artifice, to know that bereft of power or prestige or brute strength, he is man, and this is enough for him to be. And again, the annotations that she provides. <clears throat> there is a story told about two paintings made by Goya around 1700 of a Maya, a low-class Spanish woman, one clothed, one naked. It makes me angry. By many accounts, the Maya was the young mistress of the Prime Minister of Spain, Manuel de Godoy, who commissioned the paintings. At the time, what shocked viewers was the fact that the painting showed the woman's pubic hair, apparently the first time such a thing had been done in the history of painting. Our critics say Goya's audacity made the paintings profane, and in 1813, the paintings were seized by the Spanish Inquisition. And so I respond with my own narrative, creating an image of a powerful man one who thinks the world belongs to him in a wood paneled library that breaks off the patriarchy, filled with books with titles like um, Kissinger, Men and Manners in America, Making a Nation. A skull sits on the shelf, a globe stands on the floor, a knife rests on the desk. And in the second image, in the same room, just as Goya did with Maya, just as Godoy did when he pulled the cord over the painting, I revealed his nakedness, his soft, vulnerable body, his small, barely visible penis. And I experienced the power of creating these narratives, and yet I also experienced shame. Shame at the authority I wield in exposing and belittling another human being, in controlling the representation of another person's nakedness. It is obscene. <clears throat> and um, the last fourth um, portrait that uh, Sarah recreates. She was a skilled politician, a naval strategist, a linguist who spoke nine languages, but ancient Roman writers, the chroniclers of her time, called Cleopatra Harlot Queen and wrote of her lascivious fury. Not surprisingly, the story that stuck for centuries, repeated all the way through Elizabeth Taylor's Hollywood portrayal of her, was the one that men told. Men who were afraid of a woman with power, men who used their privilege and standing, their control of narrative, to frame a brilliant female politician <clears throat> as a lusty tempest who got what she wanted through sex, and who committed suicide by allowing an asp to poison her with a fatal strike to the nipple of her left breast. Of if the 16th century Italian painter, uh, Giampetrino, is to be believed. It's a fear that hasn't gone away. Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential bid made that painfully clear. Nancy Pelosi, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and other new members of the largest block of female congresswomen in the US history faced the same belittling attacks. But they're also winning important battles and taking control of their own stories. These women are writing their stories, our stories. They give me hope. And so that which, is, which I just read is sort of uh, and relates to those props that um, Sarah has added right there. Okay, and now um, I'll uh, talk about Nicole Sabe 
take his work. So Nicole is based in um, Nairobi, Kenya, and um, so she decided to do a project about um, masculinity um, for African men, how um, the African men around her see it. African men is an exploration of evolving understandings of manhood in, on the African continent and how traditional expectations are being subverted by individuals. So the first picture, here are the words. My father was the archetype, the masculine, the breadwinner. For him, a man traveled with the herd searching for green pastures. They made sure the village was safe. But he was sophisticated too, and it was actually him who suggested that I go to art school. Um, I grew up in a slum here in Nairobi, in a one-room shed with my mom. And these are words by Joel, who's in the foreground, in the front. In a one-room shed with my mom, my grandmother, my sisters. I never knew my father, but I used to see my uncles with their wives. They would come into the house, sit down, and ask, where's my food? Did someone collect the water? That was masculinity back then. So when I first started dancing, people really didn't understand. They told me I was stupid to give all my time to something that would never go anywhere. I never ever see myself as just one thing. It's only when other people bring it up. Sometimes people be like, uh, oh, you're so butch for a gay man. Or they'll say, oh, you're so effeminate. And then I remember that I do have a gender and that I'm supposed to perform and express in a certain way. In a traditional African household, a baby up until a certain age is cared for almost entirely by the women. I'm not one to only show my love through action though, to say, hey, I put a roof over your head, I put food on the table. It's important to me to also show my love by holding my son, hugging him, smiling at him. I am completely sold on the beauty and benefits of fatherhood, and I want to be a part of his life every step of the way. To man up, it's an old no, uh, school notion. Sometimes I think that being macho is just a way of covering up for one's insecurities. Being kind and thoughtful and loving, those are things I'm constantly working on within myself. I've thought far more about being alive about existence than about being a man. <clears throat> so that was Nicole. Now Ildi's project, Ildi Nyokitin, is an amazing uh, documentary photographer based in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Utrecht. And um, she decided to do a project about widowers, about fathers, who were left uh, alone to take care of their children. And uh, everyone who saw this um, project after the, uh, when it was exhibited in New York, it, it just brought tears to everyone's eyes because she also had letters from this man as part of the in installation. And um, they were very honest. Um, raising children to become happy, emotionally intelligent, Empathetic grown-ups can be hard work. For widowers whose children have lost their mother, their challenges are even greater. Does one have to become both the father and the mother in one person? How do fathers in this role exhibit their feminine side, their masculine side? So this person named uh, Bernard Rampart. Um, his wife, Miriam, passed away six years ago of MS, together with his, his picture together with, with his daughter, Maud, 16 years old. Um, and the project was uh, photographed in the Netherlands. 
Maud was adopted as a baby from China. Nick de Bruyne with his daughters Tess and Bregia. Their mother, Diana Costa, passed away two years ago uh, after a brain hemorrhage. And uh, the same girls, Tess and uh, Bregia, um, doing some yoga movements. Um, Buta the Klein and his family during dinner with his um, children in their kitchen. So he lost his wife, Cloud living one year ago. He now has the full care of their three children, Lucas, Max, and Kato. Almar van Bruggen and his two sons, Abel and Seas. Almar lost his wife, Nienke, two years ago due to tongue cancer. And now Jessica Dimmick. Jessica has worked on this project called Brick about um, senior transgender women for many years. Uh, has just presented in many ways as a film and as a story. This amazing project was recently nominated for um, World Press Photo. Um, so we're a very, it's a very important that uh, Jessica is um, getting this work out more and more actively. So Brick is a portrait series that places senior transgender women in the places in which they hid their female identities for decades. While the cultural climate around the transgender community is quickly changing and for the better, the trans women of this generation have endured a lifetime of expressing their true identities in private. And so here's a bit about the first women portrait. First time I was caught, in, I was nine years old, and everybody was um, had left the house. So I grabbed the red silk teddy thing, and I put it on. It was a Saturday morning, and I just kind of relaxed in it, and then I fell asleep. My mom and uh, my relatives were supposed to come in late afternoon, but they came in around 11. So they see me at nine years old laying around in this red silk teddy, and the story I told them was I was just feeling cold, which I'm sure anybody, nobody uh, buys uh, that you wear a teddy if you're cold. But she sounded like she bought it. Even before school, I knew I was different, but I just didn't know what it was. I hated playing football, although um, my size of my size, my size was such that I should have been good at it, but I hated it. Later in life, I tried to suppress it and I tried to hide it. When my wife met me, I had a full beard and looked like one of those guys in ZZ Top. I felt different ever since I was nine. <coughs> Through life, I always questioned myself because I didn't know about transgender at the time. And I thought, well, am I a cross-dresser? Am I gay? Am I this? Am I that? None of them really fit. So I never knew what was wrong with me and because I couldn't put a name to it. I figured I was the only one that was like this. It's something that I didn't recognize, but it's always been there, and I didn't even realize that something like that existed until I was in my 40s. When I was five or six, my mom used to use curlers in her hair all the time, those really pokey ones, and she would put a red bandana over them when she was doing her housework. At night, I would sneak out into the bathroom, and of course I didn't have hair, but I would take that bandana and put all the curlers in it and tie it to my head. I have a lot of things stuck in my head that I have never told anybody, even the wife of 53 years. The secret life was very hard to keep secret. 
it did not put, um, push a lot, but I was all, um, push a lot, till I was older. I dressed when all were done from home, when Randy went to see her girlfriend or was at Oakway Spa for three hours at a time. I draw the curtains closed because I was always afraid the neighbors would see me. And so the last one is my project um, called My New Himself. And I thought for a long time what to do and how to present masculinity in the way that I understood it. And uh, I was uh, sitting uh, in Barcelona with Maggie and we were, and, uh, we were just throwing ideas. Actually, everyone else was there too. And Maggie said, um, well, why don't you um, dress yourself as a man? And um, I said, um, which man? And um, in the end, uh, I decided to um, put on the clothes of man that uh, made a difference in my life and, um, and take portraits of myself. In a search to observe and understand the man I've gotten to know in life, I dress into their outfits. While in their clothes, I dive physically and spiritually into memories and happenings of past, as well as present experiences. I go into an exploration outside of myself, reinventing reinventing an imaginary himself. And uh, so here's the first one. I have four portraits, and I do not really mention who the men are. And then sometimes I do. So here's the first one. I remember us driving, noticing the beauty of a shape of a cloud, happy that we understood each other. We wear each other's refuge. And for a long time, we did not take it for granted. I did not see myself having your character. And this is my uh, father. But that was not necessary for me to be heard. He used to be the only one I could talk to. And this is a picture of me dressed. Uh, um, my son's clothes, but not dressed, but I taped them on myself because they're too small. So you were and you are my lasting joy. You are the only one whose clothes I do not have to wear to know how it feels to be you. And finally, the last one. Quite bearable likeness of being connected us, and we did not spend too much time contemplating our points of connection. I would still feel discomfort if there were none. And so this is the only one where I'm um, on the grass because that was the relationship that left me on the ground. And this is it. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer. together with its new members is how everything will continue. 
and um, we reflect very often. Um, we try to understand how do we feel, how is everything, and um, we say to ourselves very often that, you know, I say, I look at my uh, friends at the agency often and say, I just feel so comfortable with you all here. I feel extremely comfortable. Apart from the fact that I'm very honored to be in the agency, there's comfort and there's friendship, and, um, and there's definitely a lot of change. I have a question, I mean, I had, I had a question in mind, but now you said the word, I am very comfortable, and I would like us to feel uncomfortable, probably now with my question, which is, I don't understand your take with about masculinity and femininity. So, in the title, there is masculinity, rethinking of masculinity, uh, under the eyes of seven women, which uh, carry masculinity and femininity inside, as the men carry masculinity and femininity inside. You try to not be uh, binary, uh, but visually, all the seven projects are just allowing the stereotypes to be seen again and again. So this rethinking is failing, maybe because of the medium. But I'm wondering how to feel uncomfortable. I'm feeling uncomfortable because I'm just seeing the stereotype uh, portrayed again and again. So how do we actually rethink that we carry both masculinity and femininity without using the stereotypes, which are basically mm, wearing makeup or crying or being as a flower, that's femininity, and be strong and uh, wearing a, a blazer as for the, the masculinity. And this is not what we are as human beings. Yes. So, well, <coughs> You know, there's just so much, um, there's just so many people in the world that um, maybe do not think like you and I, for whom stereotypes are not the stereotypes that you and I know, who know very, very limited stereotypes, who know one type of a man, and one type of a woman. That's the kind of place I come from. That's how also, I don't want to name any country, I know my country. I know that at least three million people you know, think and live in this all the time, in this culture that eats each other, that eats sort of itself up and recreates it, itself. So I would say that for the people who um, believe in that, believe in things that are supposed to be this way. For them, if they see these seven different projects, something new will uh, come out, something new will appear. Um, let's say the, the, the portrait series, the non-binary series, the transgenders, even my story, even Maggie's story, um, maybe we've seen too much. Maybe you have seen too much, if this seems um, stereotypical with you. But um, I would argue that for too many people, there is still much to be told. Yeah.